if someone is trying to get into product management especially in the automotive industry can you give any tips for people who is coming there like what kinds of things they need to do unlike us europe uh, even though it's all under one union every country has its own cultural differences and it's quite different from one another and the aspect of product management and i explore is also quite different uh, between different countries i think it's still that case where project management is a biggest force or do you think people are getting more into a product mindset now i would say uh, the project management still existing in not part of europe they, where they feel that's the way of building a product because it has worked out in the past cultural difference is also one thing if you see us it has been highly competitive you see speed in general uh, stockholm has been uh, silicon valley of europe i would see uh, with a lot of emerging companies you might have heard about skype which was uh, conceived in stockholm uh, and then of course it was uh, sold to microsoft later and then you have uh, spotify which has its unique way of r- running the product management uh, which you also learn in a lot of youtube videos on how does spotify does product management can you talk about how um, you guys are thinking about building ai products especially in automotive industry everyone right everyone has started using ai technology especially deeper integration of ai in their car sharing platform and the shared mobility solution so it's more on the vehicle connectivity and the iot of things everything is under ai and the ai is also able to find all their extensive test cases possible edge cases Hi everyone, welcome back to our podcast Everything Product. In this podcast, we talk about latest technology insights, product management concepts, and we also host wide variety of leaders shaping up the technology industry. Today we got a chance to talk to Sunil Subramanian, a product leader from Volvo Motors in Sweden, Europe. We got a chance to talk about how product management as a role is evolving in the automobile industry, how the product management role varies between Euros, Europe and US. and we also got a chance to talk about how automobile industry in itself evolve is evolving and utilizing technologies such as ai to build products for the customers hope you guys enjoyed the episode let's dive in hey sunil thank you so much for taking time and uh, joining the Every- everything product podcast today so absolute pleasure rafani and said uh, to be in this podcast Awesome. Um, Sunil, just, just for our audience to know about you, uh, can you start with a very quick introduction about who you are, what you do, and uh, how you are shaping up the industry? Absolutely funny. So I am Sunil, working as a product lead at Volvo Cars. So my career, like uh, any typical uh, Indian who studies engineering, started as a developer. And then uh, I moved to Sweden in 2014 uh, for a role as an automation tester. So that's how my journey in Sweden started and then soon after that I was I joined Volvo as a QA engineer and then navigated my path towards uh, delivery and heading a program uh, for the learn and shop experience of Volvo Cars website and for the past 2 years uh, I'm working as a group product manager managing a stream of platform products mainly focusing on uh, building the logged in experience and search for the website and also maintaining the content management system the the visualization design system and developer experience for the and uh, i am having a team of around 60 people with the uh, five product managers reporting to me and i would say uh, it has been quite of an amazing journey uh, especially with the uh, transformation that's happening in automotive field and especially on what's happening on the digital end to uh, bridge the offline online experience awesome yeah even mm-hmm. i have been very uh, enthusiastic to learn how the automotive industry is in other parts of the world because we see a lot lot of changes here especially with uh, tesla and um, electric uh, transformation of the automotive industry etc uh, mm-hmm. maybe we'll start with a very broader question right uh, can you elaborate on the digital transformation in the automotive industry in general absolutely uh, so i can start with uh, the challenges perhaps so now you see uh, the, the biggest uh, challenge we have is with uh, the ecosystem especially unlike uh, a product like spotify if there is going to be any global change in the phenomena it's not going to affect them much but uh, let's take volvo for example when we had this pandemic then there were around uh, a few ships outside uh, waiting in the shanghai port because nothing could get out uh, of the supply chain and that actually delayed in production of cars and especially whenever a war occurs or uh, whenever a tariff is imposed 
it's it's a big big thing uh, uh, unlike a digital product like uh, what you have as a spotify so that is uh, uh, i would say as a major um, uh, kind of a challenge that the automotive industry is facing and every uh, every kind of an economic turmoil also reflects on uh, how the cars getting you get sold with inflation or with the tariff imposed the taxation the intrusion of chinese cars everything is uh, quite affecting us and on the other hand um, the entire industry is again going under a massive shift because every car maker is moving towards making electric cars and then uh, with electric cars it's not only even though we talk that the car industry or automotive is moving towards electric it's more than that so i would say it it depends on four other uh, important parameters especially the connectivity how can you have ecosystem of cars connected the data the how you use the car how it can be shared and in in volvo also we have uh, especially when a, when your car meets with an accident it can uh, automatically highlight uh, about the accident to the other car who is behind you so it's called the connected cars so the connectivity is uh, one one interesting aspect and then we have uh, the the computation elements of a silicon that's that's the major shifting that's happening every car is has uh, hundreds or uh, thousands of uh, chips which is quite integrated the car is uh, no more uh, the car we used to think it's going uh, under a massive shift where it's a supercomputer on wheels so th- th- that is a, a other major aspect even though we talk about the electric electri- electrified cars and how it's moving towards the electric transformation but it's more than then, that uh, also with the charging grid and how fast you can charge your car how cheaper you can pay for it and how longer you can drive so these are the different elements uh, the the industry is undergoing so considering this uh, as one part the other part i would also like to quote is more about uh, the digital transformation because in order to uh, enable the experience to the consumer you need to have a digital uh, of bridging the online offline how can you just push it a showroom choose a car and then you don't have to go to the showroom again you can do all the uh, signing of the papers uh, knowing about what you have in the contract everything through online so it uh, actually saves some amount even volvo has been trying to sell cars online uh, similar to what tesla has been doing uh, but of course uh, tesla when it started it does not have a retailer network at all the volvo is a 97 year old company you cannot change uh, the mindset of a retailer with with a span of a second so that that's what the transformation is mm-hmm. Yes Sunil I think um uh, I, very good point right so a lot of people mm-hmm. don't understand the amount of electronics and the amount of data that's been collected in a car and mm-hmm. anybody who's outside the automotive industry don't understand okay there is so much level of uh, you know um, computing that is going on inside a car they don't even realize how much of the data is being gathered and being used to make the cars more and more um, um, better right so i want to basically so a lot of people normally understand how product management works and anything that is saas b2b and all of that stuff but we haven't dug deep into anything that is automotive right so mm-hmm. i think could you maybe give us an idea of like how products are built in the automotive side right i'm assuming the product have a uh, products have longer life cycles compared to any other software company right mm-hmm. and um, could you uh, uh, and, uh, give us an idea of like how something starts from an idea in the automotive mm-hmm. industry and how does that go to the product or a feature inside a car absolutely so in the case of an automotive industry it's um, now the shift has been quite uh, immense previously the way the idea is conceived is uh, all through the design table where they sit together to dis- discuss all the design elements of a car and then based on the market need the car uh, is quite uh, promoted especially on catering to the needs of a specific customer for a specific region so that's how cars have been built uh, in the past but now with the transformation shift it's more about uh, how quicker you can get the car and also to focus on the elements which can make the customers happy so and also the price point is a really important thing especially in a global situation where uh, volvo is also selling cars uh, in uh, multiple countries the price uh, has been quite of an uh, immense shift i would say because volvo is a premium segment car it's only mm-hmm. the target customers that previously over 40 or 45 when they are quite settled uh, in their life uh, with all the money they have they can afford to buy a premium segment of a car or a premium car but now what has changed is we want to uh, have this concept of uh, volvo for life which means that it 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 needs to engage the customer right from the time they begin the car until they choose the next car or how how they pass on the 
come up to the next generation so it, and all the life comp- life beyond car components like uh, how they can uh, buy the software uh, to have a power boost in their car or buy the accessories like a tow bar or uh, if they are going for a uh, a holiday then they can have this uh, cycles that is quite on the back of their car so all those elements of uh, beyond car products is what uh, uh, every industry is now trying to sell because uh, the accessories market is quite huge sometimes it brings in a lot of money for an automotive maker more than the the cars they sell uh, especially uh, the aftermarket sales with the services and everything so th- that being one point the other element uh, which i would like to quote is uh, what volvo has been trying uh, or most of the OEMs has also been trying with, with the lease and the subscription model where they want to target um, the focus on younger generation. Uh, okay. Now with the subscriptions and lease, the younger generation uh, also wants to uh, have the affordability of uh, buying a, or getting a premium car so they can try all out and buy those cars. And similarly, we have something called Volvo on Demand where uh, you can use the app to uh, use the cars for several hours and pay for it. And that, that is a first starting point for anyone who has a few bucks in their pocket to have the experience of Volvo. So once they get into the experience of Volvo, probably that automatically kindles their thought inside the mindset at some point when they have some regular job or some kind of a steady job, they can afford for some kind of subscription or lease. So mm-hmm. it, it need not, it's not like a old days where you need to have an entire lump sum of amount to buy a car. The experience is quite changing across the automotive industry. Now that I would say is a major shift on how we sell the cars. Yeah, that's right. And and price always has been, a, uh, I think, uh, the biggest uh, problem, right, in the automotive yeah. industry. And uh, yeah. maybe funny, um, uh, just something, uh, uh, you know, very interesting is that like uh, uh, Toyota, right, like normally it earns less than a couple of hundred dollars on each of the cars which it produces, right, on profit. So most of the money is made in services parts which they actually sell. So uh, yeah. I, th- that might be a little different from uh, for premium uh, cars which is volvo but normally right any uh, regular car is the margin is very less for the manufacturer uh, mm-hmm. compared to uh, dealerships and you know other services that are being provided in between and you know they make money on that all of that stuff so yeah uh, so sunil just as a follow up right so uh, again i want to understand the whatever your uh, the portfolio of products which you uh, work right how do mm-hmm. how do you get from that initial mm-hmm. phase of requirement maybe to that mm-hmm. Uh, delivery phase right so what mm-hmm. is different from the software industry or you yeah. know, how how do things move in the uh, the product so, space in the automotive industry yeah. so uh, in the product space um, uh, at least uh, from uh, my observance what i have thought so is uh, there are two different kinds of roles especially only in the digital ecosystem space you have this product manager role if you mm-hmm. take the hardware side they have this product owner role it's more of a functional role where they need to understand the in-depthness of the domain knowledge more than uh, what we have from uh, what we have from the digital. So that sets apart uh, the role, uh, and we have this more of a safe planning, the scaled agile framework. Uh, everything is quite planned in terms of hardware. So uh, in terms of software, also we were following that, but unfortunately, with the changing landscape, it was very difficult to follow or use the safe because things get changing, the requirements keep on changing, and we want to fine-tune our website to changing market need. But in the case of hardware, uh, whenever we start building, it's more about the architecture we have underneath, the platform they call. Uh, so every car uh, now with the battery pack coming in, so the entire thing is more of a platform. So what happens behind the scene is uh, uh, from all these automotive companies, uh, be it uh, Benz, uh, Skoda, or uh, Volvo, for that matter, they, they involve in, the, in a multi-year project of building this architecture. Uh, if you have seen BMW, it's not like it can be built uh, in a day or within a few months like a digital product. It uh, goes on for several years because it involves a lot of uh, quantum computing uh, or fitting in the entire component to our, uh, the ecosystem that can work along with each other and a lot and lot of testing. And with the autonomous driving in picking up, it's, it's also quite crucial because uh, we have different levels of autonomous driving and every car maker is trying to break on how we can succeed in making this uh, autonomous driving with the regulations that is set by the each of the region that is also that also makes it more challenging but if you ask me at least the hardware side of the product it's more of um, uh, the traditional way of working but of course things have changed things have moved or started moving in rapid phase but at least they do a very long-term planning for every three months at least on what is coming up in the roadmap 
and then every requirement is quite analyzed during this PA planning days where they interact with the stakeholder to understand that uh, everything is quite put in a proper way. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, I, I know yeah. the reason why I was asking is I think that yes. that is pretty evident that a lot of times automotive companies yeah. have a lot of this project management based and it, it yeah. needs to be like that because of a lot of dependencies, right? Even yeah. a lot of parts which are put inside the automobile are yeah. not manufactured by these manufacturers, right? They are provided yes. by suppliers. Provided and suppliers. Each of them have different specs and you have to, that changes by the region and all of that. So uh, there are a lot of things that has to be considered in. That's why you have this, you know, long, very long uh, planning periods for automotive uh, side of things. Mm -hmm. And the, pro you know, it's, it's not like software where you see something every maybe uh, week, day or month. It could take maybe even a couple of years to see your product come to fruition sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, that's another yeah. thing, right? Like, even though you're working on your product for some time, like on software, yeah. you see it right away. Like you just launch it, millions of customers will use, you know, the data, how they are performing and stuff. On yeah. hardware, you might not even get that feedback, to be honest. Like until you see the car sales, even car sales might not tell the entire story. Like car sales could be impacted by several things. Actually, can you talk a little bit more about that? Like, how is the feedback loop? How does product yeah. managers taking the data that is coming in and then like, Think about the next product, both digital and like uh, physical hardware. Yeah, I can start with the physical one. So usually we have uh, this more of uh, the different companies like Benz, what I observe or BMW for that instance, what they do is they do this core driving experience. So for the employees who work in the company, they will be given this opportunity to have a subscription car at a quite an affordable price. And what about the driving trades? And the characteristics they do is quite monitored and captured in form of a log. Okay. So this happens, right? Uh, when, whenever a car is, uh, sometimes you get an early access to a car or sometimes uh, at the same time when the car is launched. So you also keep observing on how the traits are and based on that further improvement is made on the platform. So that that is one way uh, where uh, we keep track of uh, how the car and the driving experience is being monitored. But the other aspect in terms of big companies also, it's also the reputation, it's, which is quite at stake. So they do a tremendous amount of testing, testing all the edge cases on how the cars behave. And Volvo, like you know, is known for its safety. They do a hundreds of parameters of testing even before they decide on the date for launch of the car because they want to be the car to be a really perfect in terms of safety uh, before uh, giving the car away to the customer. And in terms of... Uh, Digital products like the one I have built for the, or our team has built for logged in as well as for the search. It's like a typical digital products landscape where uh, we do a lot of uh, user testing, wearable testing before even building the product to test how the product concept is going to work. And after we launch, it's all with uh, embedded analytics and also with a few flavors of A-B testing, which we also do to try to see uh, which which more, which uh, way or which uh, product is performing better or the which which uh, customer journey is uh, uh, what the customer is liking. So all those nitty gritties mm -hmm. are quite tested in the way uh, like a typical uh, digital product company works. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. And, and do you do, you do mm -hmm. over there updates or is it like uh, whenever somebody goes in for a service, this update is loaded into the vehicle? So it's it's, it's uh, over there updates, uh, okay. which happens now. And uh, so that, that is why uh, I'm saying that it's uh, even more challenging than, than it used to be. You don't need to visit to a retailer to have the software is upgraded it's everything is quite up to date but from a digital and what we want to do is the the awareness uh, the knowledge transfer for the user so they can see when is the what update they have in their car what kind of softwares or performance booster pack is enabled in the car how can we enable that in the web and the app so the user has, has a convenience to understand how much they pay and what what for they pay and when when is the Mm -hmm. expiry of uh, the booster pack or whatever the service packs they have so everything needs to be quite uh, made more transparent so they also understand what uh, what we have been doing with their car and uh, what kind of benefits they are reaping out because of this mm. yeah i have mm -hmm. a kia actually kia mm -hmm. ev6 yeah. so when when i was buying that i was like mm -hmm. debating a lot whether i should get that or not or should i wait for mm -hmm. tesla prices to like reduce I was thinking on a similar lens too, like car wise, it's mm. a good car. Um, mm. No, no questions there, especially on the digital side. That makes a huge difference, right? When I think mm. about Tesla versus any other car, because uh, be it autonomous driving, self-driving mm. or the capabilities that they give in the dashboard, that's like 
create ten times the difference. Yeah. But what yeah. I observed over time is the amount of usage that I typically probably have in the car in terms of the digital products like watching videos yeah. or it's comparatively lower. It's there are yeah. definitely use cases where I'm charging my car outside or something like that where some kind of distraction would be helpful. Mm-hmm. How is Volvo thinking in that lens? Actually, I'm going to add one more flavor there, right? I don't know if you saw the recent uh, Tesla's launch for their uh, robo vans. Yeah. Obviously, the mm-hmm. um, what is it called? Uh, what is the robots called? Optimus. 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 Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Be it Optimus, etc. So, how is yeah. Volvo thinking in that direction? Like, one is digital products, like giving yeah. all the additional aspects, and the second one mm-hmm. is like bots and uh, that that aspect of it. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, unlike Tesla, because Tesla has a huge investment, uh, it's also a public company. They want to try out and trial out new things. Volvo is, of course, uh, like I mentioned previously, uh, Volvo is known for its safety. Now, what we have done with this new cars, the EX90, which is going to get launched in US soon, has this technology called LiDAR, which is based on laser. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. what it can mm-hmm. do is, uh, it, in the in the pitch darkness, it can detect objects up to 250 uh, meters, mm-hmm. which was not uh, possible before. And most of the accidents, like, you know, it happens only in the darkness because uh, we are quite dry, tired. The visibility is quite reduced. And also, uh, it's more quiet, so you never anticipate someone to come across you. So this LiDAR technology is uh, the next step or, or next generation of safety that Volvo has been trying to do with the laser technology, identifying the objects. So this has been a kind of uh, a forefront here on what Volvo has always uh, standing for, more, more for safety. So that is one aspect, I would say. But in terms of uh, what Volvo uh, is exploring, is, uh, if you see the goals, which is also quite public in the Volvo's website, you want to move towards this electrification journey. And every car mm-hmm. maker wants to be more sustainable. With the products we make, if you see Volvo's latest car, it's more all made out of, the seats are all made out of sustainable material. And then uh, the supply chain, especially on how we uh, get these components, uh, we also are quite uh, cautious about how much of CO2 emissions happens in our factory. And we want to make that more of a green factory. So that's how Volvo wants to stand for, more for safety and more for sustainable and for a better world. That's what Volvo has been trying to do. Patient. Volvo has been like, um, I think, known for safety for a long time, right? So even yeah. b- before Tesla came, I before. think they were the ones who had always a five-star rating, But right? And I yes. also like their um, dynamic so, steering. So if you guys <laughs> remember, they had this ad where somebody was, like a person was standing in between two Volvo trucks and, you know, it was yeah. actually moving away and coming closer together, right? So they, I think it has so much of precision that you can actually do all of those things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I'm not sure whether you know that the three-point safety belt was invented by Volvo and they never okay. pay, patented it. It is oh, a huge okay. uh, uh, innovation that was done at the time. If Volvo has patented that, they could have got a millions out of it, but they don't want to patent mm-hmm. because they want that to be put to a good use. So they, they want everyone or every life uh, to be saved. So uh, that's what Volvo also stands for. Sometimes uh, we want to see uh, how we can make the world a better place. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to um, jump to the regulations as well, right? I mean, mm-hmm. typically what we know is uh, EU regulations or the Europe uh, regulations are comparatively much more stricter compared to US or many other countries. So yeah. how does the regulations typically impact in the automotive uh, product building? How, how, what do you guys take into consideration when you're looking into those? Absolutely. You know, Europe is quite famous for all these uh, regulations. So yeah. <laughs> along with the regulations, uh, there is also a huge impact, especially on, uh, I mean, be it ha- hardware or software. In terms of uh, hardware, you always have these emission standards, vehicle safety, strict global compliance, uh, which comes into picture. And in terms of softwares, uh, it becomes, uh, it's uh, with the data privacy, the GDPR, the European Accessibility Act, so it's uh, more of a regulations that comes our way. So that has been quite of a challenge uh, because uh, we also agree, sometimes you need to have these regulations and uh, there soon might be something coming for AI as well, which is also quite critical, right? Because you cannot mm-hmm. have this technology surpass the human behavior. Sometimes you need to have a checkpoint to ensure that uh, whatever the data that we give out is also uh, put to the best use. So whenever such kind of regulations come in, we as a product team are quite uh, 
prepared for it uh, in the sense uh, this regulation uh, comes to a notice even before uh, the year uh, years before they are going to get implemented so uh, we do a regular audits to ensure that uh, our websites are quite compliant uh, uh, to see how we abide by these regulations that is supported by the eu and then uh, we also ensure that uh, we have this automated way of uh, testing things uh, with a great support from the qre or the qa team to ensure that we are quite compliant by the audit and then each is each individual responsibility of the product manager and it and their team to ensure that they are also abiding these regulations and having a regular audit checks being run sometimes uh, i would say it might be a little bit tricky uh, because we have a, uh, a development roadmap that we need to cater to and sometimes uh, to do things to abide by the regulations will also take some time of us but we have been quite uh, fortunate because these regulations comes years before so we can plan uh, about yeah and mm-hmm. especially i think in the automotive field i i always remember um, uh, uh, regulations and audits were part of the cycle so that's actually a step which you have to check off even before um, uh, mm-hmm. finalizing whatever spec you are uh, getting to right yes absolutely and uh, with that software i know it's uh, like a typical uh, even if you want to have a, your product website in you you then you have to abide uh-huh. by all those regulations and china is a yeah. completely a different story that's right that's right and i think that that actually adds in more cost to making that vehicle right when you're abiding by so many of these regulations and all of that stuff so it's also the biggest thing right that the eu the tariff regulations which we have yep uh, yeah. and the taxations we impose on chinese cars and sometimes at least from all of us if you cars are manufactured in our china plant then we then need to make a sudden shift on how we can adjust our supply chain and have local factories that can manufacture the cars so we also uh, Uh, move away from the tariff uh, it's quite challenging for all the automotive makers nowadays because everyone has their factories in china yeah that's right uh, so one other thing sunil so you were you were mentioning yeah. about lidar right lidar being part of the yeah. volvo so just wanted to touch touch on that and uh, so is it now that every vehicle is having lidar uh, incorporated um, into it uh, the reason why i ask is like i know that the technology is pretty uh, you know pricey now right so it's it's not um, uh, scaled to a point where it is uh, easily affordable by everybody so is it part of every vehicle or there are certain um, sets of vehicles which, which it is part of right. it's a uh, it starts with the ex90 and ex30 okay. to some extent but ex90 will okay. be the first car to have that technology and of okay. course like you mentioned it's also quite expensive so That's right. uh, it depends on how uh, we can enable our uh, parts of it for the future cars uh, but i'm not very sure on how the strategy is going to be for the future cars okay makes sense mm-hmm. yeah yeah and and i think the the, re- the reason also i was asking is right so <laughs> i think tesla made a conscious decision that they would not have lidar part of their vehicle so when mm-hmm. you see autonomous vehicles right tesla doesn't have lidar but waymo has lidar lidar yeah. basically is i think um, uh, was used in uh, docking the international space station and all of that stuff so it's actually using lights to detect uh, all yes. of these um, um, objects right but mm-hmm. when you are using uh, cameras uh, uh, normally tesla does but there could be a lot of obstructions and all of that like the snow and all of that which basically there is more single point of failure but lidar is a much fair you know uh, mm. advanced technology which can detect all of these in autonomous so it's actually aiding for more um, autonomous vehicles and it's more safer for it but but the reason mm. why a lot of uh, 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 people are not incorporating it is it costs like maybe 20 30 or even 40000 to actually uh, in- include that part of the vehicle that's why yes. the waymo cars are maybe 100000 or 110000 and they have an argument that it's actually not um, uh, affordable by a lot of people mm-hmm. i i agree uh, then the next like i was already mentioning the price point is more uh, of a crucial thing now the reason being that with the inflations and with the changing costs it's not like a, it's a mandatory product that you need to uh, buy if you have a car that's right and uh, if you have a huge interest to pay for your house probably you might rethink twice before getting a new car So, right. and if you want to pay higher prices for it, definitely you will feel that it's not at the right time. Probably I'll do it uh, the next year or a year later. So th- that makes it even more challenging, unlike uh, the mandatory products that we need to uh, have. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Actually, yeah. I want to jump to the um, autonomous vehicles as well, right? Yeah. I'm mm-hmm. sure, like lidar and any of the new technologies, like it's probably like giving you a stepping stone to like get mm-hmm. there. Like, what are mm-hmm. your plans on like autonomous driving? I'm sure. 
I mean, if I go to San Francisco downtown right now, like I was there mm. uh, a week and a half ago, mm. I see like crazy and cra- crazy amount of Waymo cars. Every street has mm. one or the other Waymo cars going around there. So, like, how mm. do you see that vision for uh, Volvo uh, a week and a half ago? Mm. I see like crazy and cra- crazy amount of Waymo cars. Every street has mm. one or the other Waymo cars going around there. So, like, how mm. do you see that vision for uh, Volvo? But that have been quite public, uh, which I can already share. Every company is trying to do that, and Tesla has been quite of a pioneer to achieve that. But of course, there also comes a lot of challenges with that, especially on enabling the the level five of uh, autonomous driving, which is really really uh, takes a lot of things to be into consideration before having that implemented. But at least uh, what I personally feel about the vision of cars, it's more like kind of a mobility aspect that's going to be solved in the future. So my thinking, at least, is. Uh, it, it, you should not sort of that have been quite public, uh, which I can already share. Every company is trying to do that, and Tesla has been quite of a pioneer to achieve that. But of course, there also comes a lot of challenges with that, especially on enabling the the level five of uh, autonomous driving, which is really really uh, takes a lot of things to be into consideration before having that implemented. But at least uh, what I personally feel about the vision of cars, it's more like kind of a mobility aspect that's going to be solved in the future. So my thinking, at least, is uh, it, it, you should not sort of that, that have been quite public, uh, which I can already share. Every company is trying to do that, and Tesla has been quite of a pioneer to achieve that. But of course, there also comes a lot of challenges with that, especially on enabling the the level five of uh, autonomous driving, which is really really uh, takes a lot of things to be into consideration before having that implemented. But at least uh, what I personally feel about the vision of cars, it's more like kind of a mobility aspect that's going to be solved in the future. So my thinking at least is uh, it, it, you should not sort of that, that have been quite public, uh, which I can already share. Every company is trying to do that. And Tesla has been quite of a pioneer to achieve that. But of course, there also comes a lot of challenges with that, especially on enabling the, the level five of uh, autonomous driving, which is really, really uh, takes a lot of things to be into consideration before having that implemented. But at least uh, what I personally feel about the vision of cars, it's more like kind of a mobility aspect that's going to be solved in the future. So my thinking at least is uh, it, it, you should not sort of that have been quite public, uh, which I can already share. Every company is trying to do that. And Tesla has been quite of a pioneer to achieve that. But of course, there also comes a lot of challenges with that. Do you see that? spanning in europe in the next few years and um, probably an add-on to that is if someone is trying to get into product management especially in the automotive mm-hmm. industry can mm-hmm. you give any tips for people who is coming there like what kinds of things they need to do i want to add something mm-hmm. on top of what funny is saying so we didn't have anybody who has actually come from that region and talk about product mm-hmm. management so this could also be something like a starter for anybody who is residing in the Europe region to actually come or get into a product management job. So, yeah, absolutely. So unlike US, Europe, uh, even though it's all under one union, every country has its own cultural differences and it's quite different from one another. And the aspect of product management when I explore is also quite different uh, between different countries. Some companies, even though they have this uh, uh, product management role, they do more of a product owner role, you know, product owner like, Mark T. Kagan famously says it's more like a kind of a role in an agile. It's not a, uh, it's not a complete flavor of a That's product true. or evolution of building a product. So that I, that I see in a lot of um, uh, countries here uh, in Europe, and uh, I feel uh, with the traditional companies or the manufacturing companies, it's quite still tied to the scaled agile framework where they have multiple layers uh, of uh, there's RTs and the product manager and product owner role who is driving. Uh, the uh, vision of building the components and then you also have a component owner you have a function owner so that is also a, a, a multitude of different things different aspects actually supporting the product manager role uh, working in that field uh, so that is kind of something that i observe a lot and uh, at least in a place i live in because it's an automotive city similar to detroit in us uh, this is where uh, the home of volvo i live in a place called gothenburg we have the huge mm-hmm. factories where all the volvo trucks buses and cars get built so I see, at least from a hardware angle, uh, uh, that has been um, a kind of a thing that has been going on. 
but if you see sweden in general uh, stockholm has been quite a kind of a, a silicon valley of hero i would say uh, with a lot of emerging companies you might have heard about skype which was uh, conceived in uh, mm-hmm. uh, stockholm uh, and then of course it was uh, sold to microsoft later so skype was uh, originated from uh, sweden and then you have uh, spotify uh, which is which has its unique way of uh, running the product management uh, which you also learn <laughs> learn in a lot of youtube videos on how does spotify does product management which was quite modern uh, for any company for that sake so that was from uh, stockholm and then klarna is also from uh, stockholm so we do have a lot of innovation happening uh, uh, and then candy crush is also from stockholm which is also quite famous so mm-hmm. the, the way they run the products these companies have been amazing because they have been pioneers on how you should do product management and they have been teaching the world on how products can be built Uh, especially spotify uh, so th- those those are the different so it's it's a, i would say a variation in terms of uh, stockholm it has been uh, the way they build the products has been quite amazing with a lot of startups yeah it, it's it's <laughs> always interesting to learn the other side of things right so in the us it's it's a little different where maybe meta google are yeah. pioneering mm-hmm. product management but you have a different set of companies which are inspiring you to do product management the way we mm-hmm. way we are we are doing right yeah. so if you think like i were a student who's graduating from any of this uh, places mm-hmm. right how would i if i want to jump into product management how would i land my first job so is it easy hard and what are the different avenues there are there internships there could you so throw up some light there absolutely so a lot of companies especially netherlands uh, uk sweden uh, in stockholm you have this internship opportunities and they also have this global graduate program for example volvo also has this global graduate program so anyone who is on the verge of graduating can apply for it and mm-hmm. then you can get selected and then for the first two years you will be working in different departments across volvo it's not only software you work in the supply chain you work in uh, whatever the, uh, the field you want to work on you can find a rotation and work there and uh, and uh, when you enter the rotation you can choose where you want to go mm-hmm. so it, okay. it gives a wide perspective and you can work across the world in china or uh, california okay, or so in, uh, something like yeah. a rotational program where yeah, you sometimes keep... for a global graduates uh, yeah okay uh, mm-hmm. yeah and uh, i think mm-hmm. uh, another similar question right so mm-hmm. somebody who is already working in a different role mm-hmm. right so uh, mm-hmm. normally do you see people um in your company or people who are working under you um mm-hmm. do they transition like what different degrees they transition from and mm-hmm. what were their previous roles to getting before getting into product management product management then yeah. i have been moving a standing example here so it was a developer qa a delivery lead and before it moving into product i've done a complete life cycle of uh, all the roles in software mm-hmm. so mostly what i see uh, the trend now is uh, everyone wants to get into product management be it analytics ux or a developer after some time they feel quite fascinated to get into product management because you get uh, you get more of a self satisfaction on building something that you think that is used by the external world and uh, i i feel a lot of people are now switching to product mostly developers and ux people in general mm-hmm. who wants mm-hmm. to uh, try out their hand on product and that has been a kind of uh, a switch happening in uh, my companies or the companies i know of as well mm-hmm. and uh, the best way to do that is it's really hard to get that because you need to prove your metal and there's also a huge competition and unlike a developer role product managers are also quite a few it's not that every it's it's only one team can have one product manager and like seven or eight developers so the chance of getting a product manager role is also a little bit difficult but how you can do that is uh, try out your hand or at least i can share on how i did it because when mm-hmm. i was working as a qa i i showed more of a curiosity or to understand how the product life cycle works and i used to observe the product manager on how what things he have been doing and and also give my comments on how things can be improved and okay. then one of my pm when he went on a time to leave i stepped in and said i can probably pick up this product and go for some months and hours and acting pm so you can also okay. pick up and work as an acting pm trying to build out a product and then uh, nice. also talk about and share about your learning whatever you learn uh, the best way uh, to do that is also to uh, gather the uh, people for a lunch and learn session talk about mm-hmm. what you have learned okay this how uh, spotify builds product then um, uh, then obvious choice the next time is uh, you need to always start doing the role you want to be in an obvious choice you will be in it will be you who who will pick up that uh, when there is a vacancy or when they feel a need so that that's a good tip i would always share uh, so we act in a, or act without a title and do the job awesome. uh, even without a title yeah 
yeah makes sense and uh, yeah i'll i'll maybe ask uh, uh, the la- last question on this uh, the product management side yeah. in europe so when i was work for bosch right i've seen a lot of um, automotive companies uh, you know there is extensive project management influence right specifically because mm-hmm. the nature of the products we build and all of that stuff and um, it mm. was very hard for us to uh, shift that into a product mindset and we always mm. had that struggle of educating people uh, you know when i was at bosch it was a while ago mm. so what do you feel mm. now do you think it's still that case where project management mm. is uh, the biggest force or do you think people are getting more into a product mindset now <laughs> I would say uh, the project management is still existing in a lot of lot, lot part of Europe they, where they feel that's the way of building a product because it has worked out in the past. And mm-hmm. also with the cultural, cultural difference is also one thing. If you see US, it has been a highly competitive industry. I'm not sure whether you can take a six weeks leave uh, continuously as being a PM, which you can do in uh, Sweden. <laughs> yeah. In Sweden, uh, funny, I know he has also been in Europe. The entire summer, uh, Europe stops working in July, yeah. August. No one works and no one can uh, also ask you to work. And uh, and then that, that's also culturally quite different, right? In order, product management is a quite a, a, quite a compelling field. It takes a lot of energy and, and it's also quite exhaustive kind of a role. But still, uh, you can find such kind of a balance in your role, especially if you are working in Europe, unlike uh, US. But other factor I would also quote is you cannot be the same and the entire world is changing you because you also need to change to move forward with the world. And now I see a lot of companies also having this mindset shift where people also work during summer, get a team mm-hmm. of, uh, uh, previously uh, we used to have this code freezes where nothing gets deployed in the code. But now we have a few people working as, an, as long you can deploy something safe and have a reward mechanism to it. Now we can, uh, there is no freeze at all. Uh, you can have your code uh, being deployed during the summers. As well. so I feel there is a kind of a mindset shift happening uh, mm-hmm. because we also want to move forward because we are not only selling products within Europe, it's a global company. And uh, mm-hmm. I feel every company has also started feeling the same. Now uh, the quite famous thing that's, that's happening is everyone having their offshore development center being set in Bangalore. So there is a lot of... Uh, so previously it's everything quite outsourced, but now every company is having their own establishment in Bangalore, which is also changing that trend. So you don't stop during a few months in a year. Uh, there is always a demand to take care of it when you're away. <laughs> Yeah. And, and uh, one of my experiences, right, when I was working for Bosch, like we were looking at our European counterparts, they used to like yeah. very dedicatedly work for our, that office timings, but after five, yeah. you can't get hold of anybody. And um, even even if uh, the company asks them to come in, right, they I think they have a regulation where they have to provide a cab for the person yeah. and also uh, uh, drop them back home. And that's like, a, I think you have to pay them a lot more. And especially, yeah. and, and also in Europe, you can't lay people off like here. Uh, yes. it's very very hard for uh, laying off people you actually have mm-hmm. to put them in a different role do it multiple times and also give an explanation i think to the union on why you're firing that person so i think yeah uh, yes. there's a lot, lot of labor is also there. quite uh, strict here which also yeah. uh, makes it uh, quite a change but i see quite a positive change also happening uh, on how companies build product because we are all building global products awesome. yep I also want to switch a little bit in AI as well. So yes. I know that has been a buzzword and every company is trying to learn and move towards that to a certain extent. So yes. can you talk about how um, you guys are thinking about building AI products, especially yes. in automotive industry, right? Um, yes. That will be transformative if automotive industry moves to that. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. So what I see... Uh... Uh, I'm not going to be very specific about Volvo, but in general, out of my readings as well as my observance from other companies, everyone has started using AI technology, especially a deeper integration of AI in their car sharing platform and the shared mobility solution. Especially, uh, it's not uh, it's more on the vehicle connectivity and the IoT of things. Everything is under AI, and the AI is also able to find all the extensive test cases, possible edge cases, especially when you want to try uh, or test your vehicle before it's getting launched. And they are also used for more of an uh, 
uh, improved safety, increased efficiency, and also building in more of a personalized user experience. That's where every automotive company is now trying to do that. And uh, I saw one quiet thing uh, with what BMW has been doing, especially with the shift of uh, people to um, uh, electric. So they observe all the driving patterns of the users. For example, let's say you are driving a BMW. And then they say, uh, okay, now we, we have the complete set of data about you. We feel that you will benefit a lot if you switch to an electric because you save a lot of fuel. And from your driving patterns, we feel that you don't have to mm. stop for a longer time to charge because from your driving pattern, we see 96% of time you can drive with a single charge. That's how it has been for a year. So, mm -hmm. and then if you switch to electric, then this is much, this much you can save and this much you can contribute to have a better planet and indulge them to make a choice of uh, switching to electric. And mm -hmm. then all those involves AI on how they capture the data about you. And also similar cases on how we, how we analyze, especially with this personalization, uh, because as far as I know, with the AI coming in for the digital products, no two user is going to have the same experience of browsing the website in the future. It's going mm -hmm. to be quite unique on how how uh, how your pattern of browsing has been, or how how uh, what you do after you log in. So we have also been trying to experiment on how we can build such kind of an experience for the user, probably for a new user who wants. To, he's more focused on what do you think? Uh, he's more focused on. He's more focused on getting a car. So it's about showing the price points, booking a test drive, where he can find a retailer to choose a car to drive. So those are the mm -hmm. elements of information he looks for. But let's say you already have mm -hmm. a car, then it's more about accessories or trying to sell the second car to you so you can have a small second car at your home and uh, more about when when can you book your service. So if if you if we know you, then uh, we can uh, customize and offer uh, what you already look for. So that's what yeah. uh, with the capability of AI and uh, the personalizations can bring in. Totally agree, right? Like, if I don't have to think about it, like, I have a car, I need to do some things, like, every six months, every few months. If I yeah. don't have to think about it, my car just tells me that, even now, right, like, I keep getting some notifications telling that you'll have to go for maintenance. I, why do I have to do it? I have an electric car, which means most of the things are taken care of. Why do I still have to do a 10,000 maintenance? Yeah. yeah. But yeah, those personalization telling to the customer yeah. clearly, why do they have to do it? What do they have to do, etc. Yep, that makes sense. Yeah. Cool. One last thing before we end, Sunil. Um, we yeah. typically ask for like uh, book recommendations or like any podcast yeah. recommendations that you have for the listeners. Mm -hmm. Any yeah. recommendations there? Yes, I would say uh, for anyone who is starting uh, uh, to be a product manager, Inspired is the Bible. I would definitely say mm -hmm. that as a Bible for anyone who is starting. Empowered is also really good. Mm -hmm. I've also read that. And then Transformed is also uh, nice because what Marty Kagan has been showing in the past is for all the all the companies, which is quite stabilized. And then with the transform, he came up with a different aspect on, uh, on uh, uh, being away from an utopian world of a stable company. He gives a lot of suggestions how things can be done. So for anyone, I would suggest Inspired is a great book to start with. And uh, other books I would say is uh, uh, Hooked, which is definitely a great book uh, on uh, how should you create an element of interest in whatever you build. So definitely a, a great read, I would say. And in terms of podcast, uh, uh, I would say Master of Scale is by Reed Hoffman is an amazing podcast. And the other one, which I was quite fascinated, which I listened to last week was uh, uh, The Conspiracy to Make AI Seem Harder Than It Is by uh, the Spotify CTO, uh, Gustav. Mm -hmm. So that was amazing. Yeah. Uh, uh, he teaches AI in a very simple concept. So irrespective of whatever background or role you are, you can completely understand that. So it was an amazing podcast. I would suggest anyone to uh, uh, look into. Uh, and I was also doing a talk uh, last week where I, where I said uh, or quoted what uh, uh, you know, Nuval Yova uh, said. It, it's a, we are in the first time in the history of mankind where we are not sure how the go world is going to look in the next 20 years. Uh, it's um, going to be really amazing. And with the traction of what GB, GBT has been doing based on the transform architecture, Things are moving faster than we earlier thought, thought, and it's quite amazing and surprising, and sometimes even fearful as well how the world is going to turn out. Yeah, mm. this is awesome, Sunil. Yeah, thank you so much yeah. for taking time. I know it's a Sunday, but thank yeah. you so much for taking time and then talking to us. So, for anybody who wants to reach out to you, right, um, for any questions they have or anything, uh, where could they reach out to you? So they can reach out to me uh, using my LinkedIn. 
uh, so i believe that when you post this pod- podcast i can also uh, put that in the comment so that will be the most easiest way to uh, connect with me we can add and, a description uh, for your linkedin yeah. yes absolutely and uh, thank you so much funny and said it was a wonderful uh, and a pleasure talking with you guys and i wish you all the success uh, uh, keep continue the great job you have been doing and it's a uh, really useful on what you have been doing because uh, in a in from your podcast we can learn a lot uh, from other industries and uh, especially on how product management works in other industries and the different regions thank you so much thank you thank, thank you. a lot yeah. for spending so much time yeah it was really